Hello and welcome to Calvary. My name's Brad. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and I'm so glad that you're joining us today, especially if you're joining us for the first time. If that's you and you're a first-time guest, click the welcome tab, let us know who you are, and later on in the week, one of our team members will connect with you, and we have a small gift to send you as a token of our appreciation. And we are so grateful for our entire Team Calvary family. It's because of your generosity that our ministry remains strong locally, nationally, and internationally. So if you'd like to partner with us, you can do so by following the information at the bottom of the screen. All right, Calvary, let's worship. Good morning, everyone. to the Lord His love endures forever Give praise to the Lord Beside Him there's no other Give thanks to the Lord His love endures forever Give praise to the Lord, beside Him there's no other. This is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. He brought us from mourning to dancing, from glory to glory. This is the day the Lord has made, so what are we waiting for? Come on and praise the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. It's freedom for the captives. Good news to the poor And beauty for the ashes So what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Well, this is the day the Lord has made I will rejoice and be glad in it well, This is the day the Lord has made Rejoice and be glad in it. He brought us from morning to dancing, from glory to glory. This is the day the Lord has made. So what are we waiting for? Come on and praise the Lord. So what are we waiting for? Come on and praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord, I live, I live to tell what the Lord has done. I live to sing of my Savior's love. I live because He is risen. I live, I live to tell what the Lord has done. I live. To sing of my Savior's love, I live because He is risen. Now this is the day the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. He brought us from morning to dancing, from glory to glory. From morning to dancing, from glory to glory. From morning to dancing, from glory to glory. This is the day the Lord has made, so what are we waiting for? Come on and praise the Lord, so what are we waiting for? Ooh. Come on and praise the Lord, oh praise the Lord. 
about that song is it actually reminds me of one of my favorite Psalms, which is Psalm 42, which says, you know, why so downcast, oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. And it later says, uh, my soul is disturbed within me and yet I will praise him and yet I will remember. And so I just wanna encourage us this morning as we get together that no matter how we're feeling, let's do that. Let's say, yet I will praise him. Yet I will remember all the good things that God has done for me. So let's do that together. Let's remember now. Thank you, God.
this is Vince. I'm so glad you're able to join us in church this morning. Uh, if there's something going on in life that you would like to have someone pray with you for, make sure you hit that live prayer button. Someone on my team or myself will make sure we engage with you and, and pray for whatever's going on in your life. Now, let's head into today's message with Pastor Steve. Show him some love in the chat. great to be back with you all today and welcome to week number one of our new Roman series. You know we took some time off and uh, to recharge our batteries a little bit went back with the family to the east coast uh, to be a part of a family wedding and it was just a wonderful time uh, to be with those that we love and to catch up. Special thanks to our good friends Bob Cave and Sir Peter Legg who both did an amazing job over the last couple of weeks. We're so blessed by you both and encouraged by the words that you shared. You know, there are moments in our lives that have such a, a profound impact on us that it stays with us for a very long time. Moments that literally change you. I think this trip was probably right up there as one of those moments. We were, again, we were at a wedding. My niece was getting married. And this wedding was scheduled to be outdoors. It was going to be beautiful. Uh, half of the guests were actually staying uh, on this property in the woods uh, of a tidal uh, river where they had a rafting resort. And so there was a main lodge and then cabins where the guests would stay. And so we were all scheduled as a family to be there. Now there was one particular guest that was not on the invitation uh, list this guest was going to test every one of us, and her name was Fiona, Hurricane Fiona. And so we began to get these alerts on our phones, very loud weather warnings about the hurricane that was headed towards us. And uh, even as it continued to make its way north, uh, it was going to make landfall in around the area just beyond where we were the morning of the ceremony. And so, so they weighed the pros and cons, the happy couple and all the families got together and decided to push on. And so they made alternate plans to move everything inside, but to continue to have the wedding, to continue to have guests. And so we piled in a van, loaded up our, our groceries and the things that we would need for the couple days that we would be there, and we set out. This was probably about an hour north of Halifax, northeast and, and so the, the closer we got to our destination, the darker it got, and it began to rain. And so we were kind of laughing at the reality of what we were in the middle of. It sounded like a, a bad horror movie that we were in. But the, the closer we got to the place, it seemed that the weather was getting worse. And so that night, once we had checked in uh, and met up with everybody, they had a rehearsal. And so... We went through the rehearsal, and then the director of the resort where we, where we were staying, he got up at the end and said, okay, so you all know the reality of the weather that's headed our way. want to make sure that our number one concern for all of you, beyond having a wonderful time celebrating this wedding, is your safety. And so I want to prepare you all for the likelihood that the power will most likely go out, probably through the night. The worst of the weather is supposed to hit in the early morning of the ceremony on the Saturday morning. And so they said, if things shift and it makes landfall closer to where we are, we're going to come around 
to all the cabins where people are staying and leads you to the main lodge into the cellar, the concrete cellar where we can be the most safe together. Now, I don't know which sounds more terrifying, the hurricane or being led into a dark cellar with somebody that I don't know. And, uh, but there you go. That was the reality that we were faced with. And so after the rehearsal, we had a rehearsal uh, party. And so there was dinner for those guests that were there. And I could hear the wind picking up outside. And so when that uh, party kind of came to a conclusion, we made our way outside, and it was really coming down now. Uh, and our kind of cabin was close to where, where the, the party was, and so we kind of walked across a field with a lantern in our hand, just right out of a movie, and made our way to the, to the cottage and, and battened down the hatches for the night and just waited. And so uh, we finally made it to bed. I couldn't sleep. There was no way I was going to sleep. Uh, having this kind of weather headed our way. And I love weather, even extreme weather, but I can't say that I've ever experienced anything like this or this intense. So sure enough, in the middle of the night, uh, probably around, I don't know, at midnight, I suppose, the power goes out. We knew it was going to happen. It was inevitable. And, uh, and so we kind of laid there in bed, and between uh, probably 12 midnight and about four in the morning, I think the worst of it kind of hit. And I have never, like I said, I have never been in that extreme kind of weather conditions. And so I'm laying in bed, I got a little flashlight in my hand, and I'm literally shining it up at the beams above my head. And this is a, a log cabin that we're in, in the woods. And I'm shining it at the beams on the ceiling to see if they are being pulled apart. I'm not kidding. Uh, you could almost feel the rotation of where that hurricane was because almost, you could almost time it that every now and then it would pick up intensity and then whoo, the whole house would shake. Especially we were on, there was like a second floor to where we were and our room was upstairs. And that thing would shake, the windows would shake. And at a certain point you could hear parts of the roof, like the covering, the metal covering of the roof were being pulled off, and you could hear trees hitting the, the cabin and snapping next to where we were staying, and you couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. You didn't know what was outside. I think that was the worst of it. We were just telling everybody, do not go outside. We don't know what's flying around out there. At one point, we sprung a leak above where my oldest son was sleeping, and so we had to put buckets out kind of to collect the water, and then just kind of navigate the night. But I tell you what, I, I lay there in my bed, and this was like, there was a moment through the night where I just realized that this was, this was out of my control. Like I had done everything I could to keep the family safe. Now it was truly in the hands of God. And I am not kidding, all joking aside, we were, I was praying through, through the worst of that storm uh, because all I could imagine was you all getting word that Pastor Steve and his family went to Nova Scotia to a wedding and were caught up in a whirlwind and never seen again. Just like the Wizard of Oz, the whole cabin lifted off the ground. I thought it was actually possible at one point because of the intensity of the wind. But it's moments like that that change you. Moments like that when you realize that 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 I am completely in the hands of God. The people I love the most on this planet are in the hands of God. It's out of my control. And you don't forget those moments. Today we're going to begin a journey through the life-altering, history-changing book of Romans. And you know, over time there have been many great people who have left their mark on history as a result of the change in their lives that occurred when they read this book. This is a powerful book. Men like Augustine was a man who led a pretty rough and immoral life, but in 386 AD, he read the book of Romans and something happened. When he got to chapter 13, his life was never the same again after he read about putting on Christ and making no provision for the lusts of the flesh. In 1515, Martin Luther went from being a tormented man to a man filled with great faith because of this book, this life-changing, life-altering book. 
John Bunyan in 1653, John Wesley in 1738, and Karl Barth in 1918 were never the same again when they studied this book. These are only a few people who have been impacted by the truth in this book who led great spiritual movements and truly left their mark on history. So, is it just words on a page, or is it truly the words of God on a page? What about you? Do you need to experience some change in your life today? Maybe you need his Holy Ghost wind to blow, to blow into your life and to turn things upside right, to move from the dark, hopeless storm that maybe you're walking through today into the the life and the love and the purpose of God. Because on the other side of the storm, the storm that you're walking through today, even though it feels like your world is being pulled apart and you're going to be carried away, there is a new day. On the other side of what you're experiencing are new possibilities. And after that hurricane blew in and blew up and trees were fell all over the place. They had to cut the road, uh, open the road up to, to get guests in in the morning. You know what? The next day, the sun came out. It's like it never happened, and we celebrated a wedding together. We had this joyful moment on the other side of a pretty intense night. So as we begin this new series, exploring the book of Romans, I hope that you'll allow the Holy Spirit <coughs> to shine light into your darkness, speaking to you and touching your heart. And who knows, maybe you, your life, will be one of those lives that changes history forever. Now, an intensive study of a book like Romans could literally cover the span of an entire year. So we're going to take the next couple of months and look at some of the big idea verses in each chapter in order to get kind of a healthy overview of the rich truth that's represented in this book as it relates to how you and I can effectively live our lives. And few books have have shaped the landscape of Christianity like this book, the book of Romans. You know, I was blessed a while ago to have some great conversations with my mother about this particular book. She is a gifted Bible teacher. As a matter of fact, she did a great Roman study herself a number of years ago and taught it at her church in Halifax. So I'm going to be pulling from some of that research as well. So thank you, Mom. I love you so much. And, uh, but I love when we have those opportunities to share the truth of God together and its impact in our lives. And I believe that a, an understanding of a book like Romans is imperative. It's imperative in a day like the day that we're living as overcomers in a world that's, that's largely turned its back on God's word, and is doing what seems right in their own eyes. And according to Proverbs 14, 12, that way leads to death. You see, the condition of our country today is not unlike what was going on in in first century Rome when Paul wrote this letter uh, to, to the believers that were there. So I believe it's timely. I believe it's timely to the day that we're living in. Sometimes we are called things because of the stand that we take. We're called intolerant when we identify certain behavior as sin. And even Isaiah spoke about that thousands of years ago. Sometimes we think these are new things that we're dealing with that nobody's ever had to deal with before. And yet when we read the pages of Scripture, we see some strong parallels, some similarities. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 and 21 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good Evil. That sounds like kind of a a today observation, doesn't it? Who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe, or another translation says great sorrow or distress. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe. See, being clever in your own eyes and in your own sight can actually get you killed. You could have walked out into a storm like the one that we were in and, and lost your head as something soared through the, 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 the air. We need to use wisdom. The truth is only God can declare what is truly right and wrong, and it's only God's righteousness that can save us. That's why we must have a knowledge 
of the Word of God and why it's so important for us not just to read Scripture, but to study it. That's what this series is all about. See, the Word of God never changes. No matter what goes on in this world, it is the same yesterday, today, and forever. doesn't matter how politically incorrect it may be declared, <coughs> it is still the truth. And there's still only one way to the Father, and that's through the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And more and more, as we listen to news outlets and the media, we, we see that the open hostility to Christians is becoming more and more clear. Pierce Morgan, a while back, was interviewing Pastor Rick Warren on Christmas Eve when he out of nowhere just boldly declared that he felt that the Bible needed to be amended. It needed to be changed because of its stand on, on marriage. He said, both the Bible and the Constitution were well-intentioned, but they are inherently flawed, hence the need to amend it. Now, thankfully, Rick Warren was quick in his answer, and he said, no, not a chance. What I believe is flawed is human opinion because it constantly changes. And then he had added this, what is new is not always true. If it was true a thousand years ago, it will be true a thousand years from today. Opinion changes, truth does not. What a great answer that is. But sadly, it is the day that we're living in today. It's a day when society is trying to shape the opinion that your faith, the faith that you and I share, that that faith is a personal thing and is better kept to yourself. Don't rock the boat. Don't, don't stir things up. And yet the Bible says a great deal about stepping out boldly in love and sharing our faith public, publicly to other people. God has called us to be relational. He's called us to be loving in how we share the hope of the gospel. He's not called us to be obnoxious. We need to do so in a loving way. As a matter of fact, as we begin looking at Romans 1, chapter 1 today, we see the theme of the book shine clearly in verses 16 and 17. And it clearly kind of points to Paul's encouragement to let our voices be heard. Not to be quiet. Not to, to, to keep your faith as a personal thing. But to share what's going on inside of your life. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Now, that doesn't mean that Paul wasn't shamed or that people won't try to shame you and I when we share our faith. It just means that he chose not to be shamed. Why? Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. You see, that's what gives him that freedom. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. That's a key phrase. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So the theme here is the righteousness of God, or the righteousness that comes from God. In other words, God's way of justifying sinners like you and I. When you feel ashamed or fearful sharing the gospel, remember it's not about you, it's about him. He will fill you with the courage to stand justified by faith, even in the midst of adversity. So, as a bit of a setup for this series, I'd like to start with a little background on Romans <coughs> and its author. Romans, as I mentioned, was written by Paul around 57 or 58 AD. It was actually a letter written to the believers in Rome. Not to a particular congregation, but to all believers, which in Paul's day would consist of both Jews and Gentiles, but mostly Gentiles or non-Jews, who also, when we read this, we realize that, that Paul was actually called to that larger group to speak to the Gentiles. So it was very applicable. I think when we read this, it's very applicable to most of us. Some of us may be Jewish, but many of us are not. Now, the letter was not addressing any particular, <coughs> pardon me, a problem in the congregation in Rome. It was more of a, of a teaching letter. It was, that's the, the kind of the way it, it is set up. 
And so the church in Rome had, had not been started by any apostles or even Paul himself, but it seems it was started by Jews who had been in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost when this Holy Spirit came upon them in Acts chapter 2, this very powerful moment in the, the history of the church. They would return saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and re- return back to Rome to witness what they had experienced to the people around them. Now, Rome was the most important city in the world at the time, and it was the capital. It was the capital of the, the Roman Empire. But it was also extremely pagan, and they worshipped a long list of, of gods, and many of the people were morally bankrupt. And, and in this case, we see similarities even to society today. There was also people who loved God, who had accepted and were ready to accept the gospel when it was, was being preached, that were in that same area. Now, the Apostle Paul himself was a, a Roman citizen from a wealthy Jewish background who was well-educated and taught by one of the most venerated rabbis of the day. His Hebrew name was Saul, and he called himself the Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul was also a Pharisee. And he came from a, a family of Pharisees, meaning those that were separated. And now the Pharisees, we've heard a lot about over the years, were a religious and political party in Judaism with a strong commitment to keeping the law. They, they, were very, they felt very strongly about that. And for the most part, they were more concerned about their outward appearance than what was going on in, on the inside. And as a result, many of these Pharisees were far from God. There's people today that are struggling in that very same way. that are holding on to the law, that are holding on to the truth that they've been taught, but they're not living in the reality of that relationship. You see, the Pharisees thought that, that by keeping all of these laws, they were righteous before God. So when Paul, then Saul, was persecuting Jewish and Gentile believers, it was because he truly believed that, that they were blaspheming the one true God. So he was, he may have been deceived, but he was, he was honest in his deception. He, he, he completely bought it and believed very passionately in what he was doing. He was a very religious man, very rigid in keeping that law. So he thought he was doing God's work. He thought he was doing what he should be doing. He had the word, but not the spirit of that word. He knew the word of God, but not the God of the word. Now, Paul would later, as we know, be powerfully converted on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 22 when Jesus appeared to him. But then he would write Romans, this book that we're talking about, about 20 years after that. Now, when Paul saw himself in the light of a holy God, this was one of those radical, life-changing moments because he understood for the first time how incredible the grace of God was revealed in Jesus, the Messiah. He went from being a persecutor of the church to a preacher within that very same church. He went from being a man who brought shame on the followers of Jesus to being a man not ashamed of the gospel that had changed them all. A radical shift. Now, let me give you three words that that Paul kind of alludes to in Romans chapter 1 that I think are critical in understanding the gospel. And the first word is power. Romans 1.16 says the gospel is the power of God, or the dunamis, which is where we get the word dynamite. See, the gospel is God's power in operation, which results in salvation in the one who believes. And in Jeremiah 13.23, it tells us that it's not within our own power to change our nature or to, to overcome sin or to make ourselves acceptable before God. It's the power, and it's only the power of God. The second word that we see <coughs> is salvation. Romans 1.16 talks about bringing salvation. You see, the greatest manifestation of God's power is in providing for our salvation, transforming our nature, and giving all of us eternal life. He rescues sinners from the penalty of sin. And how glad we are for those that have experienced that uh, to, to, to be thankful for 
that truth today. And the same can be true for you. Maybe your life is, is filled with, with, with sin, but God loves you so much that he has paid a price for you to be, to be delivered from its power. And that can be you today. The third word that we see here in this first chapter, which is so key to understanding the gospel, Romans 1.16 also says, to everyone who believes, not just to everyone, but to everyone who believes, those who trust in, those who rely on, those who have faith in. You see, eternal life is both gained and lived by faith. God does not ask us to behave a certain way and then believe. The behaving is the product of salvation, not a means to it. And then finally, the fourth word is righteousness. Romans 1.17 says, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. Again, a very key phrase. Paul will go on in Romans 3.23 and say, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God of God. You see, faith activates God's power and brings salvation by believing in his finished work, the finished work of Jesus. And in that sovereign act, the righteousness of God is revealed. In other words, he imparts his righteousness to those who believe, making you and I justified in him. Let's pray this morning. Father, we are so thankful for the word of God that has forever changed us. We thank you, Lord, that, that we are justified in you, that you've taken us from a sinful place and, and, and set us free. You've paid a great price to see that happen. I pray that every person today that hears this message would understand that they cannot do it in their own power. They cannot find their way out of this deep hole, but they can only be delivered by you. And if that's you today, today you can simply say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart, be my Lord and Savior, and help me to live forevermore proclaiming this gospel that has forever changed me. Father, I pray that over the next two months as we walk through the book of Romans together that we would we would see a side of you maybe that we've not seen before, that we would go deeper in our understanding of the gospel and its ability to transform and change us. And I pray that we would come out reflecting more of you and less of us, that we would be less focused on the letter of the law and that we would embrace the spirit of that truth and that we would walk in your power. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God's best to all of you. Have an amazing week. We look forward to seeing you again next week for Calvary Church Online. As a final act of worship, we want to give you the opportunity to worship God with your tithes and offerings. And this is a chance for all of us to trust God with what he's given us and to invest in his kingdom. And because of your generosity, the ministry of Calvary has extended beyond the walls of our church and has gone into our community through City Dream Center and Night Shift and into our nation through partnering with various organizations and, and internationally as well. So if you'd like to partner with us today, you can follow the instructions at the bottom of the screen and giving is safe and easy. Let's pray before you go. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for every person who has participated in worship today. I thank you for the gifts that will come in and, and for what you will take and do with them. We pray that you would multiply what comes in and use it to the advancement of your kingdom, not only here, but, but all over our nation and internationally through various ministry partners. We are so grateful for your generosity to us, Lord, and we are so grateful for the generosity of our family here at Calvary. We love you so much in your name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today, everyone, and we'll see you next time for Calvary Church Online.